more than 2 million Americans will experience a whiplash injury per year. Although it's usually related to car accidents, it doesn't always have to be. It's a type of injury in which you'll suffer a sudden hyperextension followed by a sudden flexion. Basically, sudden your neck gets snapped forward and then backwards really quickly. Yesterday, I presented the case of a 45-year-old female who was involved in a car accident in which she was struck from behind at a high rate of speed. She was sitting in a red light and the person behind her was looking at their cell phone and struck the back of her vehicle. Damage was pretty severe because her vehicle was actually totaled and she had sudden onset of neck pain at the scene and was taken to our emergency department. Whether it be a major or a minor accident, any patient that suffers an injury followed by neck pain should be immobilized in a cervical collar until further medical evaluation. A history should be performed followed by a physical examination of the patient to determine what the mechanism of injury is and how severe the injury may be. That involves a thorough neurological evaluation. Now, our patient, we know that she had significant mechanism to cause a neck injury because of the high speed velocity of the injury, followed by the pain that went down in her arm with weakness of her arm was concerning for neurological injury. So just based on that alone, she should be immobilized and suspected that she has injury to her cervical spine. The next step in any trauma patient is typically a CAT scan and we usually bypass cervical spine x-rays. Why would we do that? Because it's more radiation for a CAT scan. X-rays can give us some information, but typically the lower cervical spine or the C6, 7, T1 area right at the base of the spine is hard to see because that can be obscured by the shoulder joint and that location is actually the most common place to get injured. You can actually perform an x-ray called a swimmer's view where we can have the patient hold their arm to get that shoulder joint out of the way. But again, you can miss things on even that type of image. The gold standard for detecting any type of fracture in the neck is a CAT scan to evaluate for any type of fracture within the bones. And if you're worried about soft tissue injury or any type of neurological damage, an MRI of the cervical spine is usually also ordered. That allows us to look at the spinal cord, the nerves, the discs of the neck, as well as the soft tissues, including ligaments and muscles. Here's the CAT scan of her cervical spine. And what we see right here is actually something called a cervical facet fracture or a broken bone right here. And then if we trace that back to the same level, you can see where the C4 and the C5 is shifted forward on each other by approximately 2.9 millimeters. Now, when we look at the model of the neck, this is a side view of the neck. So we're looking forward this way and we're looking in at each bone in the cervical spine. And you can see that there's a disc or a cushion between each bone. And then looking at the side view, we can see something right here that's called the cervical facet joint. And that's where whenever we lean forward, we lean back, those joints slide on each other in order to provide motion to the spine. So when our necks move forward or backward, what actually moves is the disc itself as well as the facet joint. So here you can see each facet joint right here and all of those are completely normal. But we go over to the patient's right side and that you can see that that right facet right here is fractured in half. And that is at the C4 and the C5 level. The C5 nerve root passes right by here and that's where the patient has the arm pain because this nerve is likely being irritated or compressed. Now what I really don't like to see on this patient's CAT scan is that at that same level where their facet is fractured, you can see that the C4 is shifted forward slightly on the C5 where they're not completely aligned and you can see that a little easier by looking at the back part of bone where you see a little bit of a step off right about there. It's concerning for a little bit of instability where the C4 is shifting on the C5. This is the patient's MRI of the cervical spine. And what we see here, this is the C4 and the C5. You can see that shifting slightly forward. And what we don't like to see is that this area right here where the spinal cord is, is being compressed. So what I mean by that is this is the spinal cord as it comes down through here. And in all areas, we can see where there's fluid in front and behind. This is the white stuff called cerebrospinal fluid. And then as we come down to right here at C4-5 and C5-6, there is compression of the spinal cord itself. And if you pair that with the facet fracture as well as the instability at the C4 and C5, you can see where that spinal cord might be becoming pinched. And that's what's likely causing the patient's symptoms. 
And if we don't do anything at all, and then the patient could even be quadriplegic or lose motor function of their arms and legs. So based on these things, this patient needs surgery. Now we can lump facet fractures into four different types. A type one is called an avulsion fracture, where you'll have a small piece of the facet that can break off, and those types of fractures are actually pretty stable and typically are treated with hard collar immobilization for a period anywhere from six to 12 weeks. The type two fracture is where it involves the articular surface of the facet joint or the actual joint itself with that smooth surface, and that could potentially lead to instability. And that is the type of injury we see in our patient where this is the articular surface here, but at the articular surface where the fracture is, this is disrupted. And you could even say that this facet joint, the inferior articulating surface, is not even connected with this one, and this may be something called a perched facet joint. That's a type three facet fracture where you have subluxation of the facet or dislocation of the facet. It typically results in gross instability of the spine and neurological damage like our patient has. A type four is called a fracture dislocation and that usually involves both facet joints where the spine can be completely ripped apart and that is usually associated with a spinal cord injury or when someone comes in paralyzed. That is a highly unstable injury. Now how we determine how stable a fracture is depends on a few things. The fracture type, any type of neurological injury, including nerve root injury, ligamentous injury in which we look at an MRI scan to determine if any of the soft tissues has been damaged, and looking at the alignment of the spine to make sure none of those bones have shifted. Our patient has a facet injury associated with a perched facet, as well as a neurological injury with a C5 nerve root and has evidence of instability on the CAT scan, so that patient does indeed need surgical intervention. And this patient had what's called anterior cervical discectomy infusion, where we come in through the front part of the cervical spine, remove the disc in between the two bones, and we did this at C4-5 and C5-6 because of that compression of the spinal cord, followed by a plate on front of this to stabilize everything together while it's healing. And here's the CAT scan one year after the accident where we can scroll through and see that this patient has achieved solid fusion at those two spaces. And then that area where this facet had fractures has also completely healed. The surgery itself took about two hours in which we made an incision on the front part of the spine, dissected down to the spine itself, removed the disc, replaced it with a spacer, followed by a plate and screws, and then the patient was closed up. Once the disc is removed and before we put that cage in, we can go in there and decompress any of the areas where the nerves may be compressed. And on that right side, we saw that her C5 nerve root was compressed because of that dislocation. So by sliding that spacer in, we're able to realign her spine and indirectly take the pressure off the C5 nerve. And in fact, once she woke up from surgery, that searing pain down her arm had already almost completely subsided and it took about six weeks for all the weakness in her arm to completely subside and she made a full neurological recovery. So cervical facet fractures can definitely vary on how severe they are in terms of what we do to treat them and that can range from anywhere from collar immobilization to cervical fusion surgery depending on the case. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.